Well, good morning. We're going to do something a little bit different in this section, which is focused on cities. Uh, think of the next uh, session as uh, a complex story told in a series of chapters. I will give an introduction, talk about the big themes, then there'll be seven talks that follow that will drill down into aspects of that story. And then I'll come back and, and give a conclusion. And by the way, pay attention to this screen up here, if you would, because that will help tell the story. So, first question. Why climate? I think everybody in the room will have their own, their own answer, but for me, it's about the children, and I think my generation has done a really terrible job at preparing the world for these people, these young people, and we have to do a lot better. Why cities? That's a little bit more of a complex story, and you can get to it, get to a partial answer in the new Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, and uh, they have a very interesting statement that I pulled out. Urban areas represent 67 to 72 percent of global emissions, okay? Essentially, majority of emissions come from cities, okay? How new cities and towns are designed, constructed, managed, and powered, essentially the whole process, will lock in, so that lock in, meaning it's going to be really hard to change, behavior, lifestyles, and future urban greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, it pretty much tells you that cities have to be right at the center of any solution for climate change. Now, most of the action uh, that people talk about is top-down. Carbon tax, decarbonizing the grid, electric vehicles, those kind of things. I'm more interested in the bottom-up action. Uh, community and city scale interventions. And why is that important? Well, first of all, 90% of population growth will take place in cities. 2.5 billion people will be added to cities between now and 2050. As we said, roughly 70% of global emissions are in cities. But also, really interesting, 90% of wealth creation is cities. So if you want to deal with jobs, with public health, with, cl with uh, climate, et cetera, the big grand challenges of our era, I think all the action is really in cities. Now, this shows some of the worst offenders on the planet in terms of greenhouse gas polluters. And the only way I look at it is tons of CO2 per person per year. Uh, and um, Kendall Square, which we will look at, is about 17.2 nine tons of CO2 per person per year. Now, I think these other numbers are low, probably. We didn't do this. I, I trust our numbers. I think all those numbers are high. I think we're much higher uh, <coughs> average for the US than, than Kendall Square. Now, we need to get all that down to an average of 2.5 tons uh, per person to have a 75% chance of keeping climate change under two degrees. So we look at what should be our priorities? Where can we have the greatest impact? Now, to get Kendall Square down to that area, that's a 7x reduction in CO2 emissions. Is that even possible? You know, so that's what we looked at. Okay, it's clear, societal imperative, that we need a new model for cities, and it needs to be much more data-driven, much more simulation-based. We need to have better tools to set priorities and, and figure out how to take action. So we looked at Kendall Square, case study for Kendall Square. Everybody knows Kendall Square, MIT Kendall Square. We're in that area. All these amazing startup companies it's, uh, and large companies. It's one of the world's greatest innovation districts, but it doesn't function well as a community. MIT owns this 14-acre piece of property, and it is a, an opportunity to totally transform MIT. Now, the decisions have already been made, but so this is a thought experiment, but what could it have been? So we built this city scope model so we could look at a whole series of possible interventions, and now we're building into the back end of this, this kind of model. This looks really complicated, but in, in a sense, it's, it's really pretty simple. We can, we can look at the number of people living in the district, 9,800 number of people commuting in, 42,000 people commute in and out every day. 
wasting time and energy, et cetera. We can look at all the interventions that could improve that. We'll talk about that in a minute. We can see how each will reduce the energy consumption, the CO2 that are uh, admitted in the area. We can then look at a fine grain uh, visualization of the environmental, economic, and social impact because we want to pick those solutions that address all three. And finally, we look at clean energy sources and uh, power to the grid. Okay, so let's go through quickly these interventions. You'll hear more about some of these a little bit later. Electric vehicles and grid renewables by 2030. This is kind of the conventional approach to dealing with climate. So we took the MIT transportation survey, we know where people live, their commuting mode, their schedule, and we calculate that commuting is something like three tons of carbon per uh, person per year. I mean, that's already over our total, right? So what happens if it's all electric vehicles? So in this model, we can dial the electric vehicles up to 100%, so everybody now is driving electric vehicles. So how does that affect us? Well, we start with that 17.19 tons, gets us down to 15.5. This is also decarbonizing the grid in some realistic schedule. Not gonna save the planet. Then we looked at hybrid work. So after the pandemic, we went from work largely centered in the office to more work as a distributed model, largely from home and, and third places. So we can model the impact of hybrid work. So we can, in this case, 100% of people working three days from home. We can also, okay, look at a new model for office buildings, deep uh, retrofit of buildings. We can electrify the buildings, high performance, HVAC, insulation, all of that. And so we can dial these up to 100%, so we're retrofitting every building in Campbell Square. So what does that do? 15.5 down to about 14.3. We're making progress, but we have a long, long ways to go. Live work symmetry. Now, what if we took that site in Kendall Square and other sites that are available, and we actually build enough housing so people didn't have to commute? So we end up with effectively net zero commuting. Now, that, of course, that would be housing for something like 42,000 workers. Is that practical? Maybe not. Maybe it is. Uh, but any event, in this scenario, we can dial all that up to 100%. So now we have zero people commuting. What does that do? Now, we have housing near jobs, so we also need walkable access to all the amenities that people need. So we do a lot of work with telecom data, using replica, safe craft information. We can look at the frequency of people of different profiles visiting different amenities in the cities. By the way, everything with an X here is not available at MIT, it's pretty staggering. Not quite true, because the MIT Museum just opened. So you could take that little X off. And, and then we can build a tool where we have layers of visualizations. This is walkable access to parks. She puts a park in an area that's red, it turns green. Okay, we have that covered. We can look at all the different walkabilities. And uh, so if we have 100% walkable access to amenities and live work symmetry, what does that do? So we start with 14.3. And now we're to 8.54, pretty good, much better than electrifying the grid and moving to all electric vehicles. Hyper-efficient places of living. We've been working on this for many years. People thought this was kind of a crazy idea. You use architectural robotics to move walls and beds disappear in the ceiling. We started this work, gosh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, we launched a company about six years ago that Google and Ikea funded, and I grabbed this off TikTok. Somebody, some random person shot this little video. But you can see an office on, on demand, a walk-in closet on demand. He goes over to the bed, drops down from the ceiling. <laughs> so we're making that work. We're now in, in uh, 100 buildings in 50 cities, and I think we've convinced a lot of the commercial real estate industry that this is the future. So, so we can have Small apartments for singles or singles and couple for a couple a little bit bigger. The, the dash line shows a conventional apartment, how we can get even greater functionality in a much smaller footprint at something like half the embodied energy, roughly half the cost, <clears throat> and the same or greater functionality. And we can go back to our city scope model. We can move these 
blocks of uh, different types of housing around the city, you're essentially moving profiles of people and then update the simulation and see the impact. All right, so if we now deploy this more compact, hyper-efficient housing in the city at 100%, what might that do? So 8.54 and it goes down to 8.2, but you see the social impact is tremendous because you're increasing equity and affordability for the people who are the lifeblood of the city, the young professionals and the families, et cetera. Now, <clears throat> since people are living close to work and they have walkable access to amenities, we don't need cars. That would be silly to you know, have a 4,000 pound automobile move, move you a half mile across the Kendall Square, but we, need, we do need mechanized modes. So we looked at something, uh, that has the best features of bike share and the best features of ride share like Uber, et cetera. So we call it a persuasive electric vehicle. It's an autonomous vehicle that comes to you wherever you are. We've prototyped this in the city. You'll hear a little bit more about this, like a social robot, you know, hopefully is a good citizen on the sidewalk. So if we dial the, these lightweight uh, mobility modes, by the way, you can also deliver package that way, packages up, up to 100%, what kind of impact might we have? So 8.2 down to 8.17, but again, you've, you're increasing the social performance of the community in some significant way. Low carbon diet, local production. So uh, if you look at a, a, a meat diet seven days a week, you're something over three tons of carbon per person per year. You're over your total goal. Uh, at typical American diet, still over that 2.5. If we went to a plant-based diet, you're down to something like 1.5. If we then deployed innovation for local production, you're something less than that. So right downstairs, we prototyped our uh, city farm project some years ago, looking at hydroponics, in this case aeroponics, to grow food near the point of production. There's since been a whole just explosion of creative activity for robotic farming that could be uh, near the point of consumption. And of course, you'll hear later about some, you know, technology amazing to grow meat in a lab. So anyway, the point is if we dial that up to 100% and everybody is now eating plant-based food or synthetic meat produced near the point of consumption, uh, what does that do? 8.17 down to 6.78, roughly the same impact that you would have by decarbonizing the grid and moving to electric vehicles. Sources of energy. Okay, so a lot of talk about solar. Solar is amazing, but it's very difficult to power a place like Kendall Square for a couple of reasons. We don't have land for these big solar farms. We don't, it's very difficult to get the right-of-ways to run these high voltage lines to connect the power production to where it's used. And locally, there's just not enough uh, photons hitting surfaces to power a high density city. So if we dial PV and local wind up to 100%, hardly moves the needle. Not really worth thinking about. Nuclear batteries, on the other hand, you'll hear more about that later, uh, is an amazing technology. They can be shipped on the back of trucks and deployed in a very compact space. You can have now power near the point of consumption, which is, is pretty interesting. Um, Ultimately, I think uh, we'll have fusion. So I'm, I'm really, this is an article from Technology Review about the new Commonwealth startup um, to commercialize fusion. Uh, can we build fusion-ready cities? How's that different than deploying renewables from wind and solar in ter terms of the microgrids and, and the generation uh, uh, et cetera. Maybe, maybe we can put in all of the infrastructure needed and just swap out the heat source at some point, maybe by 2040 when it's available. So if we dial the um, nuclear energy, or, or more to the point, high density baseload power in Kendall Square up, what can we get? 6.78, maybe down to 5.94. Okay, we're still not at our goal of 2.5. What is everything else? 
well, it's air travel, it's durable goods, it's manufacturing, it's the internet and server farms and all, all of those services. A lot of the talks that uh, you have heard to date are dealing with the, the first ring and the last ring. Uh, we're pretty much mainly focused on those things in the middle, which by the way, are, I think are the interventions that have the greatest environmental plus social plus economic impact. Uh, it's hard to do, but uh, I think we have to get serious about setting priorities. All right, so let's go back to 17.19. Let's just deploy the conventional, you know, green city stuff like grid decarbonization, electric vehicles, and let's do a little deeper dive into some of these. So now I turn it over to Luis Alonso. Thank you. <laughs> 